Good afternoon. Hopefully you can hear me clearly and see the slides. The question often arises, does it matter how we live our lives? What sort of people we are? Very, very often today, people say that we are free individuals, that we should be able to live precisely as we like. Um, if our philosophy is in eat, drink and be merry, then that's good. If we want a different style of life, again, that's good. The important thing is we have individual liberty. We are free people. We have rights. We have freedom. We ought to be able to exercise those rights. Therefore, people should show tolerance. And the philosophy is based on the idea that everyone is right, irrespective of what they do, and no one is wrong. Life is about opportunity. And if we actually want to benefit from life, what we've got to do is take our opportunities. And the, the philosophy is quite clearly, I'm all right, Jack. I will look after me. You look after you. Now, with that sort of background, the majority of people do seek to live what they would call moral lives. But then the question arises, whose morals? If you have a Christian commitment, the next question is, well, yes, but what sort of moral life should you follow if you are a follower of Jesus? How should you arrange your life to live in the modern world, but be obedient to his teaching? And does it matter? I think this was the question asked by the Apostle Peter in that chapter that we read from. Now, the context is very important. He is writing to committed Christians. He is writing to men and women who at one time were not Christians, but, but were converted. They were living in a basically pagan world, and they were concerned with what the requirements were on them. And Peter put the question to them, what manner of person ought you to be? in holy conduct and godliness. As followers of Jesus in a pagan world, how should you follow your life and be obedient to God? And he gave the answer later on in verse 13. First of all, he says, you should be looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. You should live your life revolving around this certainty that Jesus will return and will establish God's kingdom and that you want to be ready for a place in that kingdom. Nevertheless, he says, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Now, he says, Focus on this aim. That's what your life should be about. Whatever you do, however you live, should be geared to this principle that we are looking for that kingdom. Now, the context of the chapter is that Peter has been talking about the coming day of God's judgment. He's trying to reassure people against a background of those who say, God's forgotten, God's changed his mind, he's not going to do it. And he says, look, the coming of the Lord Jesus in, is inevitable. But that is the basis of our faith. You cannot be a Christian if you don't believe in his return. And on that basis, he says, therefore, because of what we believe, these things must follow. Our belief must influence our life. Our lives must be lives of expectation, of preparing for, and of living for the return of Jesus, so that our lives should revolve around the fulfillment of God's purpose. 
Now, he says, if you've got that sort of belief, if you've got that sort of commitment, then it demands a response. And this is what verse 14 says. And notice again, he says, therefore. The word therefore in the New Testament is very, very important. It is always saying, because of this, the following has to follow. Therefore, because of your beliefs, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. And that idea of diligent is crucial. He says, being a Christian is not an add-on that occurs when you feel like it. It is something that should be running through your life and you should devote your entire being as far as you are able to pursuing this aim. Because the aim of your life is that when Jesus returns, you will be welcomed with him and there will be no reason for him to reject you. So the principle of what Peter is saying here is that the life we have today is about preparing for the future. And we can do that because as Christians, we have a unique relationship with God. That relationship brings responsibilities and commitments. And the responsibility is that we live now as though we are citizens of God's kingdom, not as though we are citizens of Britain or of France or of Germany. He argues that because our real home is the kingdom of God in the future, then we should live by its standards today. And those standards involve rules and moral values. They will affect our thinking, our speaking, our general conduct. They will affect the way that we behave towards others. They will cause us in the lives that we live, not to be sanctimonious, but almost incidentally to be examples to others of what it means to be a Christian. And he says, in this way, even though people may scoff at your beliefs initially, they will see the effect of those beliefs on your life. And th this he argues in his first letter in chapter two. Beloved, he said, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims. And that's that point that we belong to the kingdom of God. We are, as it were, only visitors here. In the same way, if we go abroad on holiday, we will be visitors, temporary sojourners in that country. So he says, as citizens of the kingdom of God, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. And those last few words are the critical ones. The Gentiles, those who are, in this case, not Christians, may very well criticize you. They may condemn you. They may abuse you. But they will be won over by the way you live your life. And your objective, as far as your fellow men should be concerned, your fellow people, I should say, your objective should that through your influence, they will seek to glorify God and therefore be prepared for him when the Lord Jesus returns. So what this involves 
is a practical daily commitment. Um, there's a hymn that's got the line, seven whole days, not one in seven, I will serve him. And this is the es essence of what James said in his letter. Chapter two says, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but doesn't have works? He says, you can talk in until you're blue in the face about all the things that you believe. But if you don't actually put those beliefs into practice, you're wasting your time. Faith on its own can't save him. Faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So there are really two things here that Peter and that James is demanding. First of all, that we have a belief. But secondly, that we put that belief into practice. And he asked the question. Are you wearing a label that says what you are? Or are you actually showing what you are? I find it quite interesting sometimes following cars on the road, particularly cars that have on their boot the fish symbol. And it's quite interesting to note the number of times who have that symbol that is proclaiming that they are followers of Jesus, who behave in what we could describe as an unchristian, immoral, irresponsible way. James is saying, you can't behave like this. The life we live is critical. The life we live seven days a week says who we are and what we are. It says who we follow, where we get our standards from, where our morals are based, and above all, to whom do we belong? And it raises the question, is what I claim to be the same as what I am? And it's a point Jesus made in Matthew chapter seven. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But only he who does the will of my father, which is in heaven. And so the essence of this is that Christianity, the Christian manner of life, is about deeds, not words. I like to ask the question, are you a stick of rock or are you a badge? Now, badges are quite interesting. You can wear them, you can put them on, you can take them off. And if they're made of metal with an enamel coat, they can be scratched and defaced. If our Christianity is only surface Christianity, then perhaps we are badges. Sticks of rock are rather different. A stick of rock usually has the name of the place that it is advertising running through it from one end to the next. And the beauty of a stick of rock is if you cut a piece off, you are still left with the same message. And as you cut more and more bits off, the message is still there because the message runs right the way through. As Christians, we should be sticks of rock. With this in mind, much of the New Testament outlines the type of life expected of Christian believers. And I find it quite interesting to look at the structure of many of the letters, particularly Paul's letters to the early churches. They usually break down into two parts. The first part is an outline of doctrine, saying in effect, this is what we should believe. The second part is saying, 
This is what we should do. This is the sort of people we should be. This is how we should live our lives. And those two parts are linked by this word, therefore. This is what we believe. Therefore, it is inescapable that we should try to live in this way. Our way of life is our inevitable response to the things that we believe. And that response should provide a clear pattern throughout our living, throughout our lives, every aspect of our life, whoever we're with, wherever we are, whatever we are doing. I like the idea that we are God's shop window. And every time anybody comes into contact with us, they should be able to identify how our lives have been touched by God. And more importantly, the value that we place on what God has given for us. And so Romans, Paul writing to the Romans makes a very interesting statement in chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, he says, note that word, therefore, again, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God. In the modern world, this is simply a picture When Paul was writing, he was writing to people who lived in a world where sacrifice was a regular habit. People knew what sacrifices were. Sacrifices were put to death. Once they had been sacrificed, they were only good for eating or burning. Imagine the reaction of Paul's audience when they read Romans 12 and he says, I want you to be living sacrifices, not things that are dead, but things that are alive, things that continue to grow, to develop, to respond. And to achieve this, he says, do not be conformed to this world. Don't take the standards of the world in which you live, but be changed, be transformed. Take each day as the opportunity to renew the person you are, seeking to be in the image of God as a follower of his son, the Lord Jesus. If you do this, says Paul, What you are doing will be acceptable to God. And so the challenge for followers of Jesus is to do something that is unnatural. As we started off by saying, the natural aspect of life, particularly today, is to do what we want, when we want, how we want. And the New Testament says, put those desires to one side and try and do something that is unnatural. Make yourself obedient to God and to his son. Now, this is very important. Paul is not saying what you've got to do is improve the existing qualities you have. He says you've got to get rid of your natural qualities and develop new ones. And the criteria is that those qualities will be pleasing to God. And so in Ephesians, he uses the illustration of clothing. He says, put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. 
put it off. And that's what I did this morning. When I got up, I put an old jumper on. I was moving around the house doing the things that I normally do. And then I prepared for the meeting. And I took off my old jumper and I put on a new one. And that's what Paul says we must do spiritually. We must put on a new man that doesn't reflect the old qualities, which he describes as the deceitful lusts, but a new man created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And that, he says, is what we have got to do. And that is how we present our bodies as living sacrifices. Because our lives in Christ are a time of learning, of improving, of developing, and of growing. He emphasizes why this type of life is necessary. And a number of points in Ephesians chapter four. First of all, he says, you've got to think who you are trying to impress. If you don't put off the old man, then you will grieve the Holy Spirit of God. What you've got to do is not to grieve the Holy Spirit of God, but to try and please it. Because it is through the Holy Spirit that you were called, that you were chosen for that day of redemption, that you were given the invitation to his coming kingdom. And then the second reason, he says we should be forgiving one another. But why? Because we've got an example. And the example is the way that God forgave us through Jesus Christ. If God did that for us, we ought to take those characteristics and develop them in our own lives. And in Ephesians 5, another example, as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us. We said the focus of our being should be thinking of and preparing for the coming kingdom. But the only reason that we can do that is because of the willing offering and sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. He didn't have to die in the way that he did at that particular time. But he chose to because this is what his father wanted. His obedience is described here as a sweet-smelling aroma, something that will please God. We should model ourselves on this and seek to obey God so that we may please him. So, the Christian way of life is a life of awareness. Awareness of what God has already done for us. Awareness of what he has promised to do for us. And awareness of the glories of his kingdom that will be established. The life we live now should be a response to his love, shown in the past and to be seen in the future. The life we live is a measure and reflection of how committed we are to him and to our belief in the Lord Jesus. And so 1 Peter 4, if you are reproached for the name of Christ, Blessed are you. What does he mean? If people abuse you because you rec they recognize in you a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
then you're obviously getting something right. They can see in the life you live the person who you follow. And so if anyone suffers a Chris, as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter because you are living the right way. I'm very fond of the saying attributed to Francis of Assisi. He said to his followers, preach always, only if necessary, use words. We don't have to tell people that we are Christians. We should show them. Thank you.